Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, it's Thursday, February 9th. We'll be talking with Jesse Felder of the Felder Report, talking about some big picture charts that he is paying attention to, some key levels where the market appears to rotate a lot of distribution as we finish near the lows of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of stock charts. The stock charts platform was built around the discipline of technical analysis. I would argue an ideal discipline to help you manage your own emotions to minimize the impact of behavioral biases and improve your market awareness to make sense of what's happening, focus on what's working and what's not lean into the trends and uh, and have a good awareness of inflection points. The S&P, the major averages after breaking above that 4100 level for the S&P today, getting back below 4100 and we've talked about how, you know, breakouts it's uh when you have a breakout of any sort, it's all about that follow through, right? What happens after the breakout? That's why when a stock like Meta gaps higher uh, about a week ago, the question is, do we continue to push higher, right? Do we see additional buyers coming in and pushing the price to the upside? When the S&P breaks above a key level like 4,100, the question is, do you have enough buying power to sustain a move above there? Not just trade to resistance, but trade through resistance. Starting to have some question marks of sorts, I would say, on the recent breakouts we've seen when uh, things like the S&P get back below those breakout levels. We'll look at some of those charts together and see what sort of insights we can uh, make sense of. In our market recap, as I mentioned here in the uh, in the introduction, the S&P finishing lower really through the course of the day, opened higher, but then traded lower, kind of slow and steady uh, into the close. S&P down just about 4080. That's down almost 1%, about 0.9% from yesterday's close. The Nasdaq composite a little worse, around 1%, but about the same. Mid caps and small caps, both down a little more than the uh, large cap indexes. Uh, and the VIX now back above 20. That actually could be a really interesting data point uh, to pay attention to. We've uh, talked about uh, with a number of our guests, and I'm, I know particularly with Katie Stockton uh, a, a week or two ago, we looked at the VIX and talked about uh, you know what the market has been missing in terms of this bull market move off of the October 2022 low was a sustained advance on low volatility, right? And that's what 2021 really was, right? The move higher and higher, but with the volatility uh, relatively low. 2022, very much not like that, right? More of a bear market phase, elevated volatility. And now we saw the rally off the lows, but the VIX remained, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of on the upper end. Now it's coming back below 20 in the last couple of weeks. And is that the beginning of that more sustained advance? Now, all of a sudden, we go right back above 20, putting one more question mark on this uh, on this market, which uh, continues to provide new data points to uh, try and digest. Interest rates moving higher through the course of the day, that arguably is one of the big reasons or, or one of the, uh, certainly part of that story of uh, the market going more risk off through the course of the day. 10-year yield up to around 368, long bond yields around 374. Uh, the dollar index, not too much different from yesterday, to be uh, to be honest with you. And uh, we're going to talk with today's guest, uh, Jesse Felder, about the dollar and, and some of these other asset classes, how they all relate to stocks, which, you know, again, John Murphy, who's our, our chief technical analyst and, and literally wrote the book that many of us use to introduce ourselves to the discipline of technical analysis. His work on intermarket analysis was, I think, foundational in terms of understanding and respecting those different asset classes, how they can relate. And thinking about, even if you're an equity-only investor, think about the big picture and how commodities and currencies and, and fixed income markets all relate back to the stocks and ETFs that you're trading. A lot of red on the page of commodities, although copper natural grass prices moved higher using some ETFs that we track. Gold and silver both down today. Uh, energy, uh, for the most part, down as well. Cryptocurrencies, a lot of red on this page. And you can see they've accelerated to the downside. That's sort of lining up with the equity trading session. Of course, these trade 24 hours. So you're looking back to about 48 hours of trading here. And when you do so, you can see that it's been a pretty consistent decline over the last couple of days. So Bitcoin, which is up uh, 23,000 plus 
when we're doing the show uh, yesterday, now uh, back below 22,000, Ether back below 1,600. Um, so, uh, you know, again, when we talk about follow through and not just breaking out above levels, but sustaining those breakouts, now you're starting to get some, uh, you know, at the very least mean reversion move lower in some of these uh, cryptocurrencies. Let's hit a chart of the S&P 500 and then we'll get through some of the macro uh, charts, talk about breadth, maybe volatility if we can. So, you know, if there's something that concerns me about the chart, the daily chart of the S&P right now is because we have this really beautiful narrative spinning right over the last couple of weeks which was this blue shaded area, which is 4,000 to 4,100 on the S&P. That comprised the key Fibonacci level, which we talked about. And that was really one of the key objectives I think the S&P reached in mid-November. Uh, that also encapsulates where the 200-day moving average uh, 200 day moving average was in that November-December uh, rally. That's where we stalled out a trend line resistance right at 4,100. So that has become a pretty key level to watch. Now we've broken above the 200-day. We've broken above a trend line with the 2022 highs. We hit 4,100 and blew right through it. For about two days, we moved onward. We got up to 4,200 and that was it. From there, we've actually been retracing a little bit. Today, now back below 4,100 on a closing basis. We're not closed below there uh, since back at the uh, at the end of last month, at the end of, uh, the end of January. Now, again, this is just one day's move. So let's never draw too many big long-term decisions based on a short-term movement. I've always said make short-term decisions with short-term data, make long-term decisions with long-term data. So this is the you know potentially uh, something uh, deeper, something more meaningful. But overall, we're seeing it stall back below 4,100. That immediately makes me look lower on the chart. Start to think about things like the 50-day moving average, the 200-day, which are both around 39.50 to 39.70. Looking at key levels like 4,000, which was the support level, resistance level that we talked about uh, before, kind of in that October, November time period. Do we find support there if we would continue to, uh, to drift lower? But I think of it in terms of support and resistance zones, and I think we're right now back into that zone where you may expect support if you think this is more of a bullish phase but that's the question is if we're able to establish a higher low and then resume this uh this uptrend i think it remains to be seen looking at sector movements here very quickly consumer sectors at the top of the list all 11 of the s p sectors finishing in the red when all was said and done today with the xoy the closest to not doing so only down about 0.2 percent Consumer staples and technology both down about 0.4 to 0.5 percent. The worst performing sectors today were communication services. Uh, the XLC was down 2.2. Materials and utilities round off the three worst performing uh, sectors today. You know, it's interesting when you think about uh, the communication services sector, I'm immediately thinking of a chart like Alphabet. Uh, I wrote an article uh, for a couple of different places today uh, on CF Market. I sent it to my friends uh, there, Andy Nyquist. Uh, to uh, to uh, share this idea of uh, Alphabet focusing on RSI, focusing on the momentum shifts and how the momentum is fluctuating. And if you look at what's happened on the chart of Alphabet, again, this is when all of a sudden the FANG stocks start to really emerge. Now, some of them like Netflix have obviously been on a pretty good run, but all of a sudden we're having Meta gap higher. We're having Alphabet show these uh, gaps higher. We're seeing Google get above the November swing high around 102.50. Pretty powerful. And that was a level that was support back in May of last year, became resistance. Now we gap above it. But in less than a week, we've now gone below the 200-day moving average. Instead of following through on that gap, we've closed the gap and continued even lower. Now we're testing the 50-day moving average, which is about 12 points, uh, 13 points below that uh, swing high. So in just a couple sessions, all of a sudden the chart of Alphabet seems to have this very different uh, feel to it. Now, what you have to remember is in any environment, in any phase, bull or bear phase, you will have upswings and downswings. That's why Charles Dow talked about what we now consider Dow theory, foundational uh, part of the technical toolkit, which is looking at the swing highs and the swing lows. We've made a new swing high. We're now, the question is, do we make a higher swing low? I think that's a question for the S&P, which would mean, do you hold 3,800, to be honest with you? Um, question for Alphabet, do we hold about 87, which would be the low from the end of December, which means there's even more, a little more room to the downside. And you could still define this loosely as an uptrend using Charles Dow's uh, original definition. But that give back in some of those key mega cap uh, FANG sector names, uh, certainly weighing heavily on the NASDAQ and weighing heavily on the S&P as well. I did want to talk briefly about uh, volatility, and then we'll talk about breadth. The chart of the VIX that I was referring to when we were talking a little bit ago about the VIX remaining uh, low and 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 the uh, you know the market rallying not on elevated volatility but on on lower volatility for me means the VIX gets below twenty and stays there. Now that's what's happened from about mid January to really early February. As of today, though, 
we're back above 20. And I think the bear case for stocks would be, besides the price going down, which is probably the most obvious way to define a bear market phase, would be an increase in volatility, right? If the VIX doesn't just stop here, but continues higher. High yield spreads widening out would be another thing. We've seen high yield spreads come in, uh, lining up with a relatively low volatility period. If that would change and you see high yield spreads go higher, I think that could line up with wider volatility and then also uh, you know, weaker stocks. That's how that relationship tends to go. I also want to point out the AAII survey. This is when the weekly data was uh, was updated here earlier in the day. We used to actually devote a whole segment just to sentiment indicators like this. We've gotten away from it, but I did want to highlight because I think it's worth noting, there are uh, more bulls than bears. And that doesn't seem like a big deal, but it actually is. If you look back over the last 12 months, there's only been three weeks, including this one in the last uh, you know, 12, 13 months, where you could actually say that, where bulls outnumbered bears. And the way that happened is we went to almost 38% bulls in the most recent survey and the bears went down from around 35 percent to around 25 percent so a huge swing with a bunch of individual investors now i guess believing this uptrend that we've had the spread between the two is about 12 and a half percent and that's the most positively skewed that this sentiment indicator has been to go back to the october november 21 period so you have to go back over a year and really the last high for the s p 500 or the the all-time high for when the uh, when the sentiment was this skewed positive. So what's interesting is if you look in bearish phases, when the market's struggling, you tend to have bears far outnumbering bulls. There was this disbelief period in 2020. Look how long it took for us to go back to net positive bulls. But once again, we're now actually uh, actually doing it. I don't know if that makes me feel confident that this is now the recognition phase and a big wave three going higher, or if this is this the most perfect topping sign ever when individual investors are now sort of buying into this, uh, you know, emotionally into this rally, which tells us maybe uh, it may be near the end of that uh, of that upswing. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, Jesse Felder of the Felder Report. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It is a pleasure to have you join us every weekday after the close. We are super excited doing this show every day, but especially excited for our plans through the course of this year. So stay tuned as we move into our new studio, build out this uh, this show that we have and uh, bring on more great guest commentaries and insights for you. A couple of quick announcements before we bring on today's guest, Jesse Felder. First off, we welcome your questions. We're doing a mailbag segment tomorrow on Friday's show. We'd love to feature one of your questions live on the air. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at finalbarsctv. And we're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll hope to answer your question live on the air on Friday's show. Upcoming schedule here on The Final Bar. Uh, next Tuesday, the 14th, we have Ms. Schneider, Director of Trader Education at Market Gauge. On Wednesday, the 15th, Grain, Greg Harmon, from Dragonfly Capital coming to us from Cleveland, Ohio. On Thursday, February 16th, Sean McLaughlin, uh, Chief Options Strategist at All Star Charts. I want to bring on today's guest, Jesse Felder. Jesse is the founder and editor of the Felder Report coming to us from Sedona, Arizona. Jesse, Happy New Year. Welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks. Good to be with you, Dave. It's great to see you. We have a lot, of course, to talk about as always. There's a, a lot of movements, a lot of uncertainty. We've now gotten through one Fed meeting and another rate hike. And now I think the markets are sort of settling into the what's next phase. You have a number of charts that I think are really key because they're focusing on uh, on levels that I think are really, really important. Your first chart's the New York uh, Composite Index, dollar sign NYA. Can you talk us through what you're seeing here? Yeah, you know, I, when it comes to technical analysis, I really try and subscribe to the the KISS school of thought, but they keep it simple, stupid. Um, there's so many ways to overcomplicate things. And I think mm -hmm. for me, just looking at horizontal levels a lot of times can be, can be helpful. And there are uh, several levels across different markets right now that I think are just key that we've been testing in fixed income and equities and a lot of different things. And they all kind of relate to each other. 
this is one level that I've been watching for a couple of years now um, in the NYSE composite. It's an index I like to look at because it's not one that's real popular. I think so many people are looking at it, maybe it's 4,100 on the S&P. And so you have a lot of gaming of these levels, um, you know, running of stops and these types of things that can kind of complicate the picture. But 20, uh, 16,000 on the NYSE composite has represented uh, support for this index um, for most of 2021 and even into early 2022 before it broke down um, in the spring a, a year ago. Since then, it's represented, you know, essentially key resistance. Uh, we we tried to break above that, just like we broke above 4,100 in the S&P, but it didn't last even as long as, as the breakouts and other indexes. It's kind of a, a clear sign to me that we didn't have the breadth, the cry, you know, the strength, the momentum across a number of indexes to suggest this is a sustainable breakout. Um, so 16,000 on the NYC is just one of these levels that I'm watching to to help understand what what's the direction of the the larger stock market overall, the longer term direction. Are we still in a bear market, or are we going to break above this, and I think it's going to start to look a little bit better? For now, we're still below, and uh, that tells me the trend is probably still to the downside. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, before how it, it had been support in 2021. It's such an important level. I mean, if you look, it's almost just rotating right around that level. It's just great symmetry to it. You know, I guess the question for a lot of investors, particularly in the equity space, before we get to some other asset classes, is so many of these stocks have had incredible runs in, in the NYSE composite, uh, like many others, right? A big run off the October October low. But now we're sort of hitting this key level and for now kind of stalling. So what would you need to see on a chart like this or a chart of the S&P to validate a, OK, now this is the follow through. We mentioned follow through before. Like, Is there a level or a signal that would convince you that, yes, the next leg higher has probably commenced here? Yeah, you know, I, I think you'd want to see a breakout above that resistance uh, area. But I'd also want to see it confirmed by a lot of other indicators that you mentioned mm -hmm. spreads. Um, you know, one way I look at spreads is you can look at, uh, you know, ratios, LQD to IEF, HYG to IEI. These are kind of just ratios to see the relative performance of corporate bonds. It's been really strong lately. I'd want to see that continue higher as a sign of risk appetites really continuing to power higher. You know, one of the other charts that we're looking at um, today is that of the dollar index, which has also been a really good, I think, measure of risk appetites. And I'd want to see the dollar break down below this, this support level around 101.50. The dollar topped out in, you know, that late September, early October timeframe around the same time when the major stock market indexes were bottoming. And so, you know, rising dollar has been has correlated with a risk off uh, kind of environment and uh, the, the falling dollar, this reversal in the dollar has is really closely correlated with a return of you know risk on and, and uh, uh, risk taking uh, across a number of markets. So you'd also want to see the dollar probably break down as a sign that, you know, risk appetites are sustainable. And this wasn't just a counter trend rally. Um, you know, we were talking before uh, we went on air that, you know, the, there was a, a DeMarc exhaustion signal that triggered in the dollar recently, too, before this rally that suggested momentum to the downside was waning and uh, short term trend exhaustion was possible so that the dollar was, you know, poised to rally, which also because, you know, put me on kind of the defensive in the stock market saying, OK, well, if the dollar is going to rally, that's probably going to correlate with another risk off period. So, you know, this is another key chart to pay attention to. Uh, you know, if you're if you want to be bullish on stocks, you really need to see the dollar kind of sell off. And for those that aren't familiar, you and I were talking a little bit. I, I didn't realize we both had 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 spent some time thinking about the DeMarc indicators. TD Sequential is one that I know you and I both have followed. So what that basically, I think, suggests, and, and just tell me if that's true and, and whatever, however else you would add to it, but basically it's identifying trend exhaustion, right? So it's telling you when the dollar's in a downtrend, but then telling you when the downtrend is most likely exhausted. And you're you're seeing that signal kind of right around that same level. Is that right? Absolutely. And when you pair, you know, I, I really like to pair those uh, TD sequential with momentum indicators like mm. RSI or, you know, something like that. So when you see, you know, uh, price pushing to a new high or new low, not confirmed with momentum, and you also have a DeMarc exhaustion signal at the same time, it's kind of, you know, sending you a red flag that, you know, there's a high potential for reversal here. 
Yeah. Your last chart that you brought with you is looking at interest rates. Of course, we had the Fed here recently. We're now, you know, had the first rate hike of uh, 2023. And, you know, the the finish line, wherever that is, seems to still be fluid, I think, in a lot of investors' minds. When you're looking at a chart of the 10-year, talk us through what you're seeing here and what it, what it, the, how that informs how you're looking at the equity space. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up the Fed because a lot of this just comes back to the back to the Fed. It's, you know, the stock market rally, I think, has been driven to a large extent on this idea that we're going to see an immaculate disinflation, right? Where the <laughs> Fed is the Fed has done enough, inflation's going to come down, and then it's not, we're not going to see a recession in the process. Mm. And so I want to see that thesis confirmed in, you know, with the dollar. The dollar would, you know, if the dollar could continue lower, it would suggest, okay, the Fed doesn't need to be more hawkish than it is. Mm. And interest rates coming down, suggesting maybe the Fed is done and it's going to be able to cut rates soon. The 10-year uh, yield here is telling you that uh, interest rates aren't ready to break down. Perhaps, you know, inflation, there's still some inflation in the pipeline. There's still some work the Fed has to do because, you know, the Fed really only controls the short end. But it really does drag the log end uh, along for the ride, um, you know, to a degree as well. Uh, historically, uh, long term interest rates don't top out and roll over hard until the Fed is done. Mm. And so, you know, if you're if you're thinking the Fed is done and is ready to cut rates and that's going to be bullish for stocks, you'd want to see the 10 year yield kind of break below this 340 level ish, uh, which would kind of confirm that idea that, OK, and there's not a ton of inflation left in the pipeline. The Fed is you know, going to see the green light to, to be able to at least end its rate hike campaign, if not um, reverse it sometime later in the year. So and, and the dollar would could probably confirm that as well. So all these things kind of work together to give you a, a green light towards risk or, you know, as they've been doing, you know, flashing a kind of a yellow light for the rally in stocks. Mm. Um, Jesse Livermore, one of my favorite quotes of his, there, there's a time to go long, a time to go short and time to go fishing. And last week with the Fed meeting, right, arguably maybe one of those time to go fishing times, right? There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of things could happen. Can you just share now that we've kind of come through this first Fed meeting of the year, how do you approach a week like that? We had the Fed, we had earnings, a lot of potential big catalysts. When you're more of a longer term investor, uh, which I guess I would I would think of you, how do you think of a of a of a week where there's certainly a lot of potential for volatility? Do you just buckle down and think about the longer term trend, do you focus on key levels or what words of wisdom could you share on how to get, sort of get through that and not lose your mind in the process? Yeah, well, I absolutely struggle with that, you know, <laughs> taking that advice you gave early on in this uh in this, uh, you know, discussion actually before we started chatting, which is, you know, focus on your time frame, right? I, I do have, I'm not a short term trader. Uh, you know, I, I do play swings on, t you know, on occasion, but they're usually over several months to play out. I'm not, you know, day trading by any stretch of the imagination. And it's, I think it's very tempting when you get into these high vol volatility kind of environments. Um, surrounding so much data like, you know, CPI and jobs and the Fed and, you know, all these things that it's easy to overtrade and easy to, you know, take on the mindset of a short term trader when that's not at all, you know, your framework. And and yeah. so, yeah, I, I try and I think it's it's a really good point. I wrote a blog post a couple of years ago about the art of doing nothing, you know, because <laughs> oftentimes that, that is, a, is a key skill to learn is, uh, you know, is, is, is when there's nothing, you know, very compelling to do. You know, yeah. that's a good time to do nothing. So yeah, it's it's unfortunate that verbs like trading and investing imply taking action, right? It's implying right. that you need to do something. Sometimes that and that's something I've learned is some of the most successful investors. There's times when you just need to wait and see what happens. You know, we just have time for maybe another question or two. I'd love to ask you about um some of the fang stocks, right? So names like Alphabet um and others uh, you know, have started to emerge, fizzled out a little bit this week, but Overall, you know, 2022 was sort of, you know, a lot of other things working while the FANG stocks and sectors struggled. All of a sudden, growth starting to change a little bit in certain areas of the, of the growth spec, like semiconductors, uh, doing very, very well. Do you like what you see in any of these areas of the market? Or is this a time to, you know, once again, wait until these charts prove themselves in some way? I, I think it's it's critical to wait for these things to prove themselves because, you know, I've been through several market cycles myself now personally trading. And one of the lessons that I've I've garnered from not just my personal experience, but from studying markets of the past is that the leaders of the previous bull market are usually not the leaders coming out into the next 
bull market. Mm. Uh, and so these guys were, you know, led the last bull market. It's why there's still so much interest surrounding them. Um, but, you know, I, I started out as kind of a fundamentals guy and and the, the cash flow uh, that these companies are generating is, is plummeting, especially for a company like Facebook. It's down 60, 70 percent free cash flow. Google's now uh, seeing kind of a similar situation. Uh, the FANG stocks generally are seeing some serious fundamental deterioration. And uh, the stock prices have been discounting that for, for a while now. Um, but I think prob- even if we are going to emerge into a new bull market sometime soon, and, that, and that's still a question, how long the current bear market is going to play out, even if we're going to see a new bear market or a new bull market start at some point soon, I think it's probably going to be led by a different group. Uh, and, and, and these guys are not going to be the leaders um, of the next uh, big bull phase that we see. We only have a second then. So, Jesse, where would you expect leadership? Is it more the cyclical say, industrials, the energy types of names or where? Yeah, I think it's in in the commodities group. I, I yeah. think, you know, uh, if and this comes back to inflation, if you think inflation is more of a secular rather than a cyclical trend, then that is going to make it difficult for these past leaders that benefited from low interest rates to lead the market going forward. And it's going to be more kind of sectors focused in real assets. Jesse, there was a ton of uh, investment uh, wisdom in those comments you've made here in the last 10 minutes. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Stay safe and uh, stay warm there in Sedona. We'll talk to you again soon, all right? Oh, it was great to chat with you, Dave. Thanks. That's Jesse Felder. Jesse's the uh, founder and editor of the Felder Report coming to us from Sedona, Arizona. I, I love the simplicity. It's in, in a lot of ways, I think Jesse and I are as kindred spirits in, in having a very simplistic way of illustrating key levels to watch. And I always talk about lines in the sand, what levels you're watching with three charts. When he sent it to me earlier, when we were talking about it, I was thinking, this is, these are three just really key levels and talk about the simplicity of just seeing, are we above or below this level? What does that mean? And thinking about where we might need to uh, change our positioning or our perspective. Great take there as always from Jesse Felder at the Felder Report. We have to wrap the show folks and go to the three and three. Let's talk about three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Chart number one, I spent some time earlier today looking through breadth indicators and on my breadth chart list, one of the charts that immediately jumped off the page for me was the bullish percent index. This is a breadth indicator derived from point and figure charts. So we have these bullish percent indexes for a number of different uh, groups of stocks. The S&P 500 is the one I pay attention to the most. As of yesterday, I believe the bullish percent index went back below 70 So if you look, these pink shaded areas go back to the beginning of 2022 or uh, first quarter of 2022, the pink shaded areas are when it has gone above 70. Look at what has happened soon after we've gone back below 70. Those have been the drawdown phases or at the very least the pullback phases within downward trends or upward trends. So be aware and be wary as you see that indicator get below 70 and remain there. Chart number two in our market recap, we talked a little bit about Sentiment indicators, I highlighted the AAII survey. This is a weekly survey of individual investors. In this case, finally, net positive, net bullish for the first time since the end of March of last year, almost a year ago. It's only been uh, net bullish two times in the last 13 months. And to see more of an extended period when that's that's happened, you have to go all the way back to uh, you know 2020 to 2021, really the bulk of that bull market phase. So while this could be the beginning of something much more magical and bullish than what we've seen, with very few bears out there relative to historical averages, it leaves me skeptical thinking that now all of a sudden we're turning net positive is that the end of the move let's let price tell us for sure finally the chart of the gambling index i'm looking at some of the names that are working today when uh, other gambling stocks have done very very well off of the october lows a lot of these and this is the gambling group that we're looking at actually bottomed out in june before the market's low in october so it made a higher low in october From there, just a nice rotation. As I take a step back from the monitor, I see a distribution phase in the first two thirds of this chart. And then I see an accumulation phase. It may be a little overextended, right? The RSI recently overbought. We're coming back a little bit potentially, but overall the trend is still in place. What would you need to see if you're long this group here? What would you need to see to not be long anymore? What level would you break? This is the top ranked industry and our industry scooter ranking. So a good one to break down. Folks, that's a wrap for this show. Special thank you to Jesse Felder of the Felder Report joining us from Arizona. All of our previous episodes are at StockChartsTV.com. For Stock Charts and Rev in Washington, I'm Dave Keller. We'll see you tomorrow.
Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.